Hello, this is John F.D. Taff. Um, I'm recording this reading for Sadie Hartman's Celebrate Horror Month in 2020. Um, I'll be reading from this lovely uh, Thunderstorm Books edition of Mark Matthews' recent addiction anthology called Lullabies for Suffering. It features stories by me, by Mark, by Caroline Kepneys, uh, Keelan Patrick Burke, uh, Gabino Iglesias, and um, Mercedes M. Yardley. Um, before we start, uh, I'm going to give you a trigger warning. My story uh, in this book is called The Melting Point of Meat. Uh, it involves self-inflicted pain, um, cutting, and that sort of thing. So if that uh, is triggering in any way for you or is too disturbing for you to listen to or to read, then you might want to look at one of the other wonderful author's readings that Sadie is offering. Um, I'm going to make two apologies also. One is for my wild pandemic look uh, that I'm sporting these days. This unshaven uh, stay-at-home look that I've got. And uh, my final apology before I start reading will be uh, the use of my old man glasses that I have to use to read my own work. So without any further ado, oh, um, one more apology, I guess. Yeah, I've got pugs sleeping at my feet if you hear snoring. That's what that is. I've also got a lot of construction going on in the house today. So if you hear the odd pounding or rattling or whatever, that's that's what that is. So without further ado, without further, further ado, here we go. The Melting Point of Meat by John F. D. Taff. The knife. It's a zipper, right? It lets me open up and share the things that are inside me. Things that I'm too embarrassed or repressed to share. Yeah, that's what I believed at first. It lets me feel things that I'm too numb to feel. Stupid now, huh? Too many nights spent with teenage girlfriends, alone in my upstairs bedroom, while my parents snored away obliviously downstairs. We listened to My Chemical Romance, our death cab for cutie. Talked about who was lame at school and who was lamer. Huffed model glue, our cans of air we lifted from staples. You know the kind you used to blow crud from your computer keyboard. Blew our minds better than boys, or music, or fuck, even each other. With a pocket knife that used to belong to my grandfather, we cut ourselves. Tentative, whisper-thin streaks down our arms, not vicious or deep like the boys who we knew who also did this, who would then stand around and watch the blood patter around their feet. No, just enough to break the skin, to draw a red hairline, just enough for the long sleeve t-shirts we favored to cover. We winced as we did it, but we giggled just as much. It was something to do, right? Something to share, something that made us feel like we understood each other when we really didn't even understand ourselves. I mean, how could we? But it also opened something within me. When I did it, for a few seconds after, in the hazy adrenaline eye of the pain, I would close my eyes, but I could still see Patterns, like some abstract thing close up, the details of it sharp and clear as if my eyes were open and pressed too close to clearly make it out, like waking up hungover, sprawled across someone's cheap-ass Ikea throw rug, my eyes fluttering open onto a, its weave of coarse fibers twisted together with cat fur and curls of pubic hair. I couldn't tell what it was, but each time I cut, each time I rode the blissful waves of pain, I saw it, saw a little cl more clearly. And like the endorphins that coursed through me each time, I wanted more, to see more. When was the first time I realized that pain brought pleasure? In other words, when was the first hot hit I took, the first buzz I felt? No, it wasn't in college or even high school. It was far earlier than that, in grade school can't remember exactly how old I was, probably six or seven, but I was out riding in our little cul-de-sac. It was a beautiful summer morning, all sun shining and birds chirping, dogs barking in the distance, the static of cicadas providing background white noise. That was back when parents would let their children, even little ones like I was, play outdoors out of sight. I think my mom was in the backyard hanging clothes on the line, or more than likely on the phone with one of her cronies seated at the kitchen table, twirling the cord and smoking palm malls, one after the other, crushing them out in the chipped, 
Lake of the Ozarks ashtray, bitching about my dad or having to deal with me during the summer break. So there I was, racing all by myself. Don't remember having any friends with me that day, round and round the center island of our little pocket street, on a bike or tricycle, maybe. I can't precisely remember, probably a big wheel, you know. The pink Barbie version my parents bought for me instead of the regular model with the red body, yellow fork, and black wheel. Pink wheels. Yeah, whatever. So I was out riding and I took the curve too sharp and too fast. Ended up wiping out spectacularly. Spilled ass over tea kettle into the street, sliding across the concrete on my belly as if I'd just successfully stolen a base. My little top protected my belly, but my short pants probably a matching your animal's outfit, knowing my mom. Didn't offer much protection for my bare legs. I lay there for a minute, dazed. When I rolled over, I saw the big wheel canted up onto the curb like a shipwreck, one of the rear wheels still turning slowly. Then I looked at my legs. From shin to slightly above my knees, they were scraped by the rough concrete, the skin rucked up in pills, like pills on a favorite sweater, exposing raw flesh underneath blood already beating there. I remember staring at it for a long time, trying to make sense of it. Not what had happened, I knew that. I wrecked, wiped out, knowing mean the why of what I saw there. My scraped legs stretched before me. I could already feel the pain, the hot stinging of all that abraded skin. But I also felt, over it or under it, pleasure, the tingling of something warm and enjoyable. Enjoyable, yeah. Something that felt distinctly good, like my mother brushing my hair out or lazing in the sun by the side of a pool. It was comforting. Then I lay back, staring at the blood on my legs, and had that feeling, an epiphany, that you don't often get in life of putting two things together and getting the larger picture. Right there, sprawled in the middle of the street, I acted on that. I wanted more. With the same ache I felt when my mother snapped the television off mid-cartoon, and it was all good until I heard something that I eventually re realized was my mother screaming. She found me there, lying belly down in the street in that sort of upward dog yoga pose. Not that anyone had ever heard of that back then. Dragging my body across the rough concrete, sanding the skin away, leaving a pale line of blood in my wake. As she tells the story, my eyes were closed, my face almost transported into rapture. She thought, still thinks, it was something sexual, something unseemly precocious in nature. Me humping the concrete and leaving what looked like a smear of menstrual blood. And in front of the neighbors and all. It was nothing of the sort that was entirely about pleasure. And that indistinct, wholly malleable line between pleasure and pain. But mostly about my need for both. There were no sororities for me in college, no ma'am. Even though my mother was a legacy at one of the biggest on campus, I crushed my mom in a whole lot of ways, I'm sure, but I never saw her more defeated than when I told her that there was no way I'd be rushing her sorority. There'd be no dressing in whatever passed as the latest in fashion, no batting my eyes at the frat guys trying to ply me with beer to get into my panties, no sitting around having tea parties with flowery cups and linen doilies. Whatever. I obviously had no idea what went on in sororities and still don't and don't care. My mom was disappointed though and I carried that in a backpack of other disappointments I lugged with me all the time, everywhere. No, no sororities. I went into the dorms where I settled in with a roommate from Missouri who introduced me to her profound sleep apnea. I, in turn, introduced her to my own brand of casual bisexuality. Within a month or two, uh, within a month or so, we had our own little band of girls, kind of like our own sorority. We hung out, we listened to Nine Inch Nails and Azar Swan. We dyed our hair ombres of dark turquoise and violet and garish pink, painted our nails black, wore ripped fishnet stockings and skirts that barely covered our asses, and we cut ourselves. As with all the other stuff, I showed them how. None of them had ever done it before. None of them had ever eaten pussy either. But I showed them that, too. By then, though, I had stopped believing that the knife was a zipper. I had changed the focus of why I did what I did. My belief then was that we are like balloons. 
and that our skin is a thin layer of material, like latex, holding all the swollen things within, the rush of blood, the twist of sinews, the slick conviviality of organs, a flick of the blade against the thin barrier that held this in, and it could be exposed for all to see. Nothing quite like sitting around your dorm room naked with a few of your best buds, high as fuck, sliding a thumb a thin boning knife down your inner thigh, its minuscule, icy, its minuscule, icily sharp tip leaving a furrow in your skin, like a boat skimming across a red sea. Where there had been little pain in my life's meanderings, now it was more definite. I scored my flesh more deeply in college than in high school, deep enough for the little tip of the knife to disappear beneath, beneath my tight, white flesh, blood beating from the pores behind it. The first time I had been brave enough to do this, little Miss Missouri gasped, turned her head and yapped in the trash can her parents had given her the one that sat beside her bed, the word princess bedazzled across its pink steel side. The smell of her cheap wine vomit vomit momentarily blotted out the sugar cookie scent of her Yankee candle, whose flame was the only light in the room. As she freaked, I climbed into her bed, my skin sliding against hers. She thought I was trying to comfort her, and maybe I was. But as one hand went to her face to caress her cheeks and brush the tears away to shush her trembling so that no one would batter out her door wondering what was wrong, the other slid the knife slowly, gently along the, the side of her breast. She might have gasped as I did this, thinking it was just me, just my finger toying with the side of her firm, corn-fed tit, that I might trip a finger across her hardened nipple before I... before... I lowered my face to that bloody tit, sucked powerfully, then darted my lips to hers. I saw her powerful confusion as she tasted herself on my tongue. She wept as she came, and we lay there bleeding together. Hello, my name is Livy, and I am addicted to pain. That was it. I hope that was disturbing in all the right ways. Uh, again, this is from A Lullabies for Suffering. I would really recommend that you get that. Uh, it's a great book. The stories are fantastic. Um, I have a uh, novella that's going to be set in the timeline of my uh, four-part book called The Fearing, uh, which is available on Amazon. The new one is called The Fearing, Blood and Brimstone. It'll be available sometime uh, late this summer, I think. Uh, it's also being made into an RPG role game. So uh, you can follow me on Twitter at John F. D. Taff. And uh, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed it.